The scripture for this Sunday is from Matthew 25, 31 to 45, the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. Pastor Duane will now bring us the sermon. Thank you very much, Pastor Barb. I announced uh, during the announcements um, something that I'll share again. Um, because our techno gurus are, are recording this service, this is the portion of service that will get out onto the ether, into the ethos of the Internet and be lost, and, and hopefully it will reach a few people. Uh, for those folks who would, would be listening to this service uh, um, later uh, by way of the recording, uh, I just want to point out again that, that the, the times that we're in right now are quite unusual. We have made a call out to our folks, uh, to our congregation, not to feel like you have to be physically in worship service with you. Uh, since people's needs are so much rooted in, in you know, people of faith, we really we need to worship. We need to pray so our doors will stay open Uh, for those who come and and you folks are here today. We appreciate you being here and worshiping with us. Um, We keep in mind that where two are gathered in his name, Christ is present, and we we appreciate that. Um, And then the doors will be open after the COVID crisis as well that everyone can once again gather as a body of Christ. I'm also a little bit in tension this morning. Um, I I was told uh, uh, some months ago by one of our church members, he gave me a butterscotch candy, and he said, here, take this butterscotch, put it in your mouth when you start preaching, and then when the candy's gone, you should be done preaching. Uh, Then another member this morning told me, well, since we're not having Sunday school, you should be able to preach until about 1130, and I, I don't know if I can do that or not. (laughs) <laughs> There's a tension there. Uh, whatever the case may be, however much time this takes us, uh, the, the prayer is and the hope is that, um, that we'll be uh, drawn a little bit closer to God's word in and through my words. With that being said, yesterday is history, tomorrow a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. This quote is variously attributed to different authors. One could be author Alice Morris Earle in 1902. 
Joan Rivers, then Bill Keen in the Family Circus cartoon in 1994. And finally, it's been attributed to Uguay in the 2008 Kung Fu Panda animated movie. Uguay is a couple of hundred years old, so I vote that the quote is probably actually his. Yesterday is history, tomorrow a mystery, today is a gift of God. People have a tendency to get wrapped up in time, especially when there's stress, when there's anxiety or a sense that time is short. Seconds become minutes, minutes become hours, Hours turn into days, and even years seem like they go by in the blink of an eye. For some, even for some gathered here today, yesterday is a prison, tomorrow full of fear, and today, today for many is at best a struggle. Today is especially despairing time for those who are hungry and thirsty, for those who do not have adequate clothing, those who are sick, those who are unjustly imprisoned, or who are strangers in another land, or worse yet, who are outcast in their own land. For these, the future holds hope only in faith. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, Matthew starts, then things will change. Justice will be known. Many interpret this scripture as a point in chronological time. Some place this event to be at the end of what is known as the tribulation, the seventh year reign of the Antichrist, when Jesus comes to the clouds to establish a millennial reign on earth. Others place it on a chronological timeline after the final batter, battle, after the defeat of Satan at Armageddon. Either way, on this dispensational timeline that's so popular today, the timeline of life on earth, in that timeline, either way, the church has already been raptured. Believers caught up with Jesus well, if that's the only interpretation for this scripture, the rest of the scripture then has no relevance for those of us who are the church. We've already been caught up in the rapture. But there's another possibility for understanding time. It has to do with an appointed time, an opportune moment or a due season rather than a specific point along a chronological timeline. To try to illustrate in this sense, time in this sense, time is an opportune moment. Uh, I'd like to share a story of a young lady. She went off to college at the, uh, near the end of her first semester, about three months in. She finally sat down and finally had time to write her parents. The short version of the letters has followed. She writes, Dear Mom and Dad, it's been three months, and I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I received when I jumped out of the window of my dormitory when it caught fire at a keg party shortly after my arrival are pretty well healed now. I only get those sick headaches once a day. I know how much you are looking forward to being grandparents, and I know you will welcome my fiancé and expected baby with the same love you gave me. Page two. The time is now opportune for me to tell you that my dormitory did not catch fire. I am healthy and not with child and don't even have a boyfriend, let alone a fiance. However, I am getting a D in history and an F in science. And I wanted you to receive that news in the proper perspective. Signed, your loving daughter. This young lady's sense of finding the right time to tell her parents bad news meant creating a situation in which time stopped dead still for those parents. When their hearts started beating again on page two, they would forgive her, maybe. 
She reminded them that things could always be worse, no matter where you are in life. If they were thankful that page one did not happen, they just might be thankful enough to accept page two. We celebrate this season of time, Thanksgiving. A time to give thanks for the blessings of, in food, our blessings in clothing, health, the blessings we have in relationship. A blessed approach to this season can come in understanding that Jesus is present in all his glory now, bringing his kingdom near through our actions. This season, Thanksgiving, and this day is a gift of God. And we make Jesus known by celebrating our relationships with each other and by being open in compassion to those in need. The parable that is our scripture for today foretells of a future judgment day. Jesus teaches in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Tomorrow is a mystery. Yet there's something in us that we need to know what tomorrow will bring. And so theologians over the centuries have scoured the Holy Word for prophecy that will clue us into what's in store. I'm preaching today to say that folks, now, now is always the opportune time for truth. When Jesus spoke with Pontius Pilate after he was arrested, the concern of the Roman government was that Jesus, as king of the Jews, would start a military or political action against them. Jesus told Pontius Pilate, uh, as we read from the Apostle John, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. My kingdom is from another place. Christ's social activism is not political. It is grassroots. And he says, but now my kingdom is from another place. Christ comes into our lives when the time is right or opportune. Yeah, I, I think this judgment that he's giving here in Matthew, I think it does happen in, in a chronological timeline, and there will be a future judgment. But judgment also happens in the heart of people every day, in the timing, in the fullness of time. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations, all the people will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The rest of this parable, in a nutshell, tells us that what we do in this world will be judged. It also tells us that we don't have the capacity to see ourselves for what we are without the benchmark, the judgment that was once law, but is now the throne of Jesus Christ. Jesus illuminates people's lives and classifies the people, the nations, sheep or goat. That's really not much of a choice in my mind. You can either be a sheep or you can be a goat. I want to be a soaring eagle. In my mind, I'm already there. But Jesus says he's going to divide us sheep or goat. A guy I once knew was proud that he had Native American bloodline. I think it was Cherokee Indian uh, is how he traced his family tree. He thought him of himself as being of the bear. 
Jesus says that the final judgment will sort people into only two camps, sheep or goat. Animal, animal experts write that in North America, we can easily tell the difference between sheep or goat. Simply to look at them. They're, they're evidently uh, different. But they also say that in Asia, parts of Africa, the sheep and the goat actually look a lot alike. And it takes a very discerning eye to tell the difference. There was an animal photographer who took a picture of an animal that was sticking its head out of a barn opening. He posted an article, uh, posted the picture with an article about sheep. And then a friend called him up, told him that his sheep was actually a goat. And the only discernible difference was in the ears. One has floppy ears. The other has short, pointy, sticky-outy ears. I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys to decipher which is which. In this analogy of sheep and goats, my mind wonders, the way it does sometimes, and wonders, what about llamas? Could we be sheep, goat, or llamas? Disney has a cartoon in which a very selfish prince becomes transformed into a llama. But he can still speak. It's fiction, okay? Initially, this prince doesn't even know that he is now transformed into the body of a four-legged llama creature. So the prince goes up and he talks to somebody. This person is totally surprised to hear a llama speak. He freaks out and runs away, screaming, Demon llama! The prince is clueless until he sees himself in a mirror. And finally, upon seeing himself, he doesn't recognize himself. And he turns away from the mirror and runs away screaming, Demon Llama! Again, it's just a cartoon. Well, in today's scripture, Jesus only differentiates sheep and goats. On a chronological timeline, as you consider it, Llamas have already been cast into the lake of fire. Demons? Or they've been renewed into Christ's word. Like what happened eventually in the Disney cartoon. But for now, we're only concerned with sheep and goats. Those who are not pure evil. In fact, some interpret the original Hebrew of nations in the scripture to be only those who turn to Jesus after the rapture of the church during the millennial period. The question is, what is it that makes a person a goat or a sheep? To look at them, they're not always e easily differentiated. It's easier to discern a sheep from a goat by their behavior. Sheep are communal. They gather together. They graze peacefully and they listen to their master. Goats, on the other hand, are independent scavengers. Uh, at best, goats are described as being opinionated and curious, or, on the other hand, vulgar, dangerous, and destructive. Some have likened them to Jack Russell Terriers as bullies, bully goats. Get it? Descriptions of goats include the adjective odious, they smell. So I was out with a friend the other week when the weather gave us uh, uh, a, a full week of, of beautiful weather. I guess it was Indian summer. Sunshine, warm weather. We were sitting inside a small airplane. The door was open. We were talking about flying, of all things. When the smell of fertilizer came to me, and it really hit me hard, I asked my friend, how about if I close the door? He said, why? I don't, I don't smell anything. The point is that sometimes we get, we, we get used to things, you know, including behavior in ourselves that is of the goat. And to the point is that we don't even notice it in ourselves. We don't even notice our own smell. Not literally, well, maybe. Worse is when we don't acknowledge our own shortcomings and deny the sinfulness within ourselves. 
without Jesus Christ in our lives, we are all goats. In this parable, both groups, sheep and goat, are judged by the very same criteria. To the sheep, he says, verses 35, 36, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. So the criteria is taking care of people's needs, being compassionate. To the goats, the criteria, he says in verses 42, 43, I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Same criteria. Both groups react to Jesus in the same manner. Both groups, sheep and goat, are surprised. In neither group is there an awareness of their own behavior, not unlike the demon llama in Disney's cartoon. The goat's response in verse 44, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison? When did we see that and not help you? And we see the sheep's surprise in verse 37. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? I don't remember that. Neither group is aware of themselves until the time comes that they look in the mirror in the light of the throne of Jesus Christ. In the time and place of the judgment seat of our Lord, the righteous will live. The goat counts how many times he feeds the hungry or clothes the needy. He keeps track. That is the sinful humanity showing. Ever since we were enlightened to know the difference between good and evil, we keep score. With pride, the goat says, when did I not see a stranger and invite him in? Jesus says, not as often as you think. The person that pleases Jesus, on the other hand, has ingrained themselves so much with compassion that they don't remember helping people. The only way to become a sheep is to allow the spirituality of Jesus Christ into your very being, expressing compassion to others. By expressing to others. It's not only in these ways that Jesus lists in Matthew. There, there's other ways as well. Compassionate acts run the gambit. They're all, uh, uh, so I, I've heard of people, they ch- help somebody by the side of the road change a tire just because it's who they are. People who reach out to a stranger whose need is obvious just because it's the right thing to do. And then immediately it's forgotten. When you follow the way of the master and become the person who follows the example of Jesus Christ, so much so that you don't even think twice about being attentive to others around you who are in distress, then you are in the right place and season to be be, uh, both giving and thus receiving blessings from heaven. In closing this out, The past is history. Let it go. The future is a mystery, even though it might be predictable. Today is a gift. Today is a gift of God. So make the most of it. Look in a mirror and ask yourself truthfully, do you see a sheep or do you see a goat? The time is opportunity in this season of Thanksgiving to follow the master and to be the kind of person who will enjoy eternal life. Amen.